Welcome to Crying Out Cloud. I'm Eden from the Wiz CTO office, and with me today is Amitai. Hello. Amitai is from our Fair research team, and we are going to recap the biggest cyber security events of the past month. We're going to cover all the most novel vulnerabilities, then we're going to go through the most impactful incidents, and you're going to be up to speed, suffering them down. Mm -hmm. Are you ready? I'm ready. Cool. Which vulnerabilities in the past month caught the most attention? So there were two vulnerabilities that certainly caught our attention, uh, and we spent a bunch of time looking into them and understanding how they could impact our customers or not. One was in CWP, uh, Control Web Panel, which is a really popular and free uh, control panel for Linux servers. So this vulnerability was an unauthenticated RC vulnerability, which basically means that an attacker who gains access to the server can execute code remotely. Um, and this was reported to CWP in July, fixed in October, uh, but only really got it, caught people's attention in January when the researcher released a POC uh, exploit for the vulnerability. So this was just out and about for a really long time. Yep. As, as happens. I mean, there, there are a lot of vulnerabilities that get fixed way too late. Um, and once they're fixed, you know, the, the vendor takes a while until they sort of get around to saying, hey, you should patch this. You know, it's bad. And this one was quite easily exploitable, it sounds. Yeah, um, it was very easily exploitable. Um, uh, it seems like, you know, anybody could have just downloaded the PSC and ran this and, and, you know, it would have been golden. Do we know if anyone was golden? So, uh, according to both the NSA and Shadow Server, uh, who monitor for these sort of things on a regular basis, uh, they saw uh, attackers, bad actors using this uh, to try to find stuff online. That's not good. It's very not good. And is CWP prevalent in cloud environments? So you'd think it would be, uh, because as I mentioned, I think it's, it's popular and free. And uh, we looked at our own data, and we didn't really find it that much uh, among our own customer base. You know, it's possible that our our data is a bit biased. You know, maybe you know the kind of customers we have don't really use this specific kind of software. Um, but you know, it's probably being used by at least some cloud users. So whether or not I use it in the cloud. You should definitely be batching this because it's terribly easy to exploit. Okay, so if you're listening, you have CWP, go batch. Yep, batch, batch, batch. There's another vulnerability you want to talk about? There is another vulnerability. Which one's that? Um, so this was a vulnerability in software called Manage Engine, developed by a company called Zoho. So Zoho Manage Engine, for those who don't know, <laughs> uh, but not for Eden because she knows, is a tool for monitoring and managing hardware uh, across your entire IT fleet. Uh, so the vulnerability was another RC vulnerability, uh, and it was patched in October, but for some reason Zoho took a long time to sort of announce this to the world. People are slow. People are slow, too slow. Um, mm. And very similarly to the other vulnerability I spoke about, um, you know, people noticed this and attackers started exploiting it, which is bad. Um, and it's possible that, you know, if you if you do batch diffing, uh, which is uh, when you sort of take the latest version of Sanctuary and you compare it to the previous version to look for stuff that you might be able to exploit. So if bad actors were doing this, uh, you know, whether or not Zoho, you know, was telling them that this was possible, they might have found the vulnerability on their own. And what was this vulnerability? So um, this vulnerability allows you to get RCE with system permissions, basically, you know, running as root on the server. Um, and there are two conditions here. One, which is pretty obvious, is it has to be online, has to be publicly exposed. But the second, which is sort of curious, was that uh, the server has to be configured to use uh, SAML SSO. But for some of their product lines, which were impacted by this, uh, it was enough that you had ever uh, configured SAML SSO to be enabled. Like even if you if you ever enabled it and then disabled it, uh, you'd still be vulnerable, which is... Really like haunted by your old SSO. Exactly. You were haunted by your past bad decisions of this configuration. Um, and so like... A lot of people might be like, okay, there's a really bad vulnerability, but I see that it only, you know, it only impacts those who are using SAML SSO. I don't use SAML SSO, or maybe I don't want to patch, and I'd rather just turn off a SAML SSO for a while. Little do they know. Little do they know, but they, they'd still be impacted by this. Okay, so they're haunted by their old SSOs, but how do they know? How do they track their old disabled SAML SSOs? So I, 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 I am uh, saddened to say that I, I tried to look into this and I tried to figure out if there is... Stuff is unpromising. No, it does not. If there's an easy way to figure out, you know, 
to answer the simple question, have I ever enabled Symbol SSO on my Zoho Manage engine? Unfortunately, I couldn't really find any straightforward answers to this, and I tried looking for like tools that people may have developed following this vulnerabilities uh, release that might let you answer that question. I couldn't find any. If any of our listeners are, are, are aware of those, then you know, feel free to post them in the comments. Assuming we have comments, I don't know if we'll have comments. They should share. They should share the knowledge. We want their knowledge. Sure. They have. So Zoho, because I happen to know what Zoho is, is has a SaaS product that's entirely cloud-based, and they have an on-prem version. Mm-hmm. Um, we have, however, seen cases where customers take on-prem version, and they put it on the cloud yeah. for whatever reason. Um, Do their own. Teach their own. Um, if you were using the entire cloud-based version or the on-prem version, who's affected? So according to Zoho, um, only the on-prem version is affected. Like the cloud version is SaaS, which means that they basically patch it on their end and you connect to them. And the moment it's patched, then everybody everybody's versions are patched. So good for you if you're yeah. in the cloud. Using the cloud version, cloud is good. Use the cloud. We're biased that we link the cloud. Highly biased. Yeah. Um, but surprisingly, as you mentioned, you know, we do occasionally see customers installing this in their cloud, uh, the on-prem version. Um, so, you know. So they need to get on it. Yeah. Patch, patch, patch. Patch, patch. Let's get serious. Let's talk about the incidents. Incidents are fun. More fun. More dynamic, more interesting. Um, what incidents or I can say cautionary tales happened in the past month that may have kept CISOs up at night that we should definitely make sure people are aware of. So the first one I want to talk about, which I'm sure most of our audience, if not all of them, uh, I've heard about is the uh, Circle CI incident. So Circle CI released a report about an incident that took place in January, uh, along with guidance for their customers on how to deal with the fallout of this incident. Uh, the bottom line is that someone breached Circle CI's network and managed to steal customer secrets. That's not good. Very not good. And just so everyone's on the same page, what does Circle CI do? So Circle CI was known as a CI CD platform, um, and it enables all sorts of uh, DevOps processes. And the way it works is you need to store your own secrets uh, on the platform. Uh, they could be long form, long term secrets. They could be short term secrets. Um, there are all sorts of ways of of handling this, uh, but that basically means that a lot of customers have their AWS access tokens, their GitHub access tokens stored with Circle CI. It's all the good stuff. Mm-hmm. Circle CI. Very attractive to attackers. Like if you have an attacker, you have a button you can press that lets you get access to Circle CI. You would be pressing it twenty four seven. So how did this happen? So according to the report, um, an employee's laptop was infected by malware. And the attacker sad for that employee. Very sad. Yeah. Although, you know, maybe it was maybe the malware made him happy. Maybe maybe it was choice. We don't know. Um so the threat actor, once they installed the malware, you know, they were monitoring what the attacker was what the employee was doing. Uh the employee logged into Circle CI systems. Hmm. Uh and then that saved an SSO token to their machine. The attacker stole the SSO token using the malware and then logged into Circle CI's production systems from you know, an attacker control location. Wait, but back to the beginning, how did the laptop get infected? It was like the employee was like, the way I picture it, the employee was sitting, getting coffee. He was sitting in a coffee shop, the bathroom opened up, and he was like, what am I, I got to run really quickly. And then the hacker swooped in. So that's one possibility. Yeah. Like, you know, if you're writing fanfic about this incident, like yeah. that's definitely popular fanfic. Okay. But he could have been emailed also, like, here's yeah, a gift card. Like, you know, looking online for where do I download TikTok from? I don't know if you download TikTok. I don't use TikTok. Do you download TikTok or do you install it? I'm on Instagram. Oh, okay. So it's like maybe he was looking like, where do you download Instagram from? Right. Um, and then, you know, he got served an ad that had a link to malware instead of Instagram. And then he installed that. And like he was happily using Instagram, but little did he know that he actually had malware. And little did he know that all of Circle CI's back end was just going to become exposed. Mm-hmm. But he was the initial access point for this attacker. Uh, Did he have to have high permissions for this to have happened? Yeah, so um, high is relative, right? Mm-hmm. Like one company's high permissions might be another company's low permissions. Uh, depends how you define it, but they were definitely high enough. Like this, this employee had access to production systems or at least had the capability of generating uh, access keys for production systems. And that was good enough for the attacker in this case. So and, I define it as high. Yeah, sounds high. 
And like in a theoretical sense, shouldn't an employee have that much visibility? Like that much access to customer keys and whatnot? You, you've got to have at least some employees. It should be, you know, the minimum amount that have some access in some shape or form to employee data, um, you know, for whatever reason, whether it's to solve technical problems, whether it's to make sure things are working correctly. Um, and, but you should have guardrails in place and you should have multiple of them, uh, just in case one of them, you know, fault breaks down. Uh, and in this case, there weren't enough security boundaries and circle CI is, has said as much in their report where they said that they, uh, had implemented a bunch of changes to their backend, to their infrastructure, to make sure that this kind of attack can never happen again. Um, unfortunately, like the main thing of interest, at least, you know, to me here is, um, how did the malware get to the employee's laptop? Um, and other than releasing a few hashes and a few file names, they haven't really said like what this malware actually is, uh, which is kind of bad because you've got to assume that, uh, this attacker is probably going to try again, maybe not against circle CI, but against someone else. No, but they're out there and these are their tactics. They can't. And you just don't know, like, you know, it'd be really nice if we had, you know, this is the kind of malware they used. This is how they got in. You know, you should be looking out for this. You should be looking out for that. Uh, we just don't know. So what steps should you take if you have circle CI? Or if you haven't already taken them, what should you do if you have Circle CI and you may have been exposed, your secrets may have been exposed? Um, so I think the best advice I could give uh, would be to read the blog post that we published on this, uh, but I'm biased. Is that on here? Read our blog post, wiz.io yeah. blog. W-I-Z.io. And that will give you guidance on how to uh, search for evidence that you might have been impacted by this. Uh, and you know, there might be a scenario where you're a Circle CI customer um, and you're afraid that someone stole your keys. Um, so this is how you figure out if anyone's using stolen keys to gain access to it. But no matter what, you should just go and rotate. Yeah. So like the, the, the best thing you can do in these cases, in any case where you're, where a company that you're a customer of has their, you know, has their keys stolen or whatever, uh, the first thing you should do is rotate. So like in this case, Circle CI did a lot of that work themselves. They rotated keys for their customers, but yeah, I mean, that's like the, you know, the, the, the basic. Bare minimum. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but you should definitely do it uh, if, you, if you have the, the ability to do so. Do we know how many customers or do we know any high profile customers that were affected? So according to Circle CI, only like five customers came forward and said, hey, we were impacted by this. We think someone used the keys that were stolen from you in order to gain access to us. Um, I think the only company that's come forward publicly to say, you know, that they were impacted was Grafana. Um, and there was some speculation that maybe Slack, uh, was impacted as well, uh, because they released a statement that they also had a security incident involving stolen keys. Um, and the events sort of lined up with the timeline published by Circle CI, but we don't know. But that's fishy. That's fishy for sure. Yeah. Okay. So that's a big one, Circle CI. Um, and there's actually a long list of these service providers to software companies that have been affected in the past year. Ton. Ton. Okta. LastPass, name one if it comes to your head. <laughs> Twilio, Heroku, um, and similar reasons. GoTo is also targeted in an attack. Yeah. Um, it's like these bottlenecks for storage of company secrets are like they've got shimmering yeah. colors around them. Attackers like shiny things. Shiny things are good. Shinier than keys. Yeah. Bullshit. Um, and so GoTo and LastPass have people's usernames and secrets, their passwords. Um, and something went down at GoTo. You want to tell us what happened? I will tell you. Um, so GoTo, who some other people, other people might know as Long, Long Mian, uh, announced that they were breached as well last November. Uh, they only announced it recently, uh, because that's probably when they figured it out. So they're a cloud-based remote working and collaboration service that so they define themselves. Um, and in this case, customer usernames and passwords were exposed, um, which shouldn't happen ever. Uh, so this actually has a root cause that goes a bit, a bit back further in history. So, um, uh, 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 LastPass, which is a go-to affiliate, they announced that they were breached in August of last year. And this like, probably everybody's heard about this. Um, and what we now know is that the attacker sort of later moved laterally from LastPass network to GoTo's network. And they got these usernames and passwords, but weren't they encrypted? So they were encrypted, 
uh, you know, which which makes you wonder, like, how did the attacker do this? Uh, and the answer is simple. They managed to also get their hands on and the encryption key. So, you know, they got the jewels inside the box. The box was locked with a key, but they also got the key. So they effectively have the jewels. So they got the usernames, the passwords, the encryption key. But how did they move laterally? Like, what, like, if you're hearing this right now and you're like, this is bad, this is scary, this is a bad incident. So they move laterally in these environments. How do you avoid that situation? So according to LastPass's report, you know, from way back in August and piecing together the pieces from the different reports uh, by both companies, um, to the best of my understanding, what happened was that you had a compromised employee mm-hmm. similar to, you know, the other case we spoke about, um, and the attacker moved from there to source code that this employee had access to. That source code had hard-coded secrets, uh, which is sort of a no-no. Um, the source code uh, secrets led to uh, a second employee, and that second employee had access to uh, a cloud environment that was shared by LastPass and go to. So that's another big one. And I think there's, you know, it's interesting. We're talking about these incidents, and we're mainly focusing on the software industry. And rightfully so, we're concerned with these supply chain attacks and their large-scale impact. You hear these stories, and you're like, whoa. That is immense that they have access to so many um, secrets and that, like, this capacity for exposure is impossible. Um, But there's also incidents with really immediate real-world effects. Um, So if you're listening to this or if you're us and you're, you know, going about your life in the world, um, there's also these incidents that kind of affect us. So segueing into a really crazy one that happened that I want to make sure we talk about, which happened with Commute Air, um, which is a little bit different in storyline than the other two, but I think is definitely should beg the question, anyone listening, would I be successful against what went down? Um, and if it happened to me, could I fix it? Which is the big question, I think, in a lot of these incidents in general. If uh, CISOs reading this are probably asking themselves the same question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Commute Air, this is a good one. Everyone should listen. If you stop listening, you should definitely listen again. What happened? And you should be there. to this one if you're listening. Yep. But don't listen to the rest of the podcast. No. But definitely you're an optimal Commute Air because it's a good story. So uh, so would you like to know what Commute Air is? I mean, I've flown Commute Air before, so I happen to know. But if you haven't, yeah, tell them what that is. So Commute Air is a uh, U.S. airline. Uh, and like many other U.S. airlines, they have access to what's known as the TSA no-fly list. Um, which is a list of people that are uh, banned from traveling uh, to or from the United States uh, because they're considered a security threat. Um, and a security researcher managed to prove that Commute Air had effectively exposed this list online, which is bad. Which is really bad. Do um, the people on this list know they're on this list, or was this like, hey, good morning, you know they're on the SA no fly list? Unless you've like tried to fly and then, you know, we're were blocked and said, like, you can't fly, uh, then you might not even know that you're on this list. Um, and uh, this might be, like, the first time that people are discovering that they're on this list. It's really crazy that it's out there. Yep. How did that happen? Um, so in this case, like, unlike the other two incidents were, which were, like, bad actors gaining ac- access to networks, this was uh, security research. So this was, like, a white hat hacker um, who was looking for stuff that they could get bug bounties for, uh, looking for exposed servers online, uh, and they managed to find a Jenkins server uh, that allowed anonymous access, uh, which is misconfiguration. Like Jenkins servers, if you want them to be secure, you have to make sure that um, ideally, you know, they're not accessible from anywhere. And if they are, ideally, not anyone on the internet should yeah, be able to just able to just come in and, and look at your at your at your builds. Yeah. Um, not ideal. Yep. So in this case, uh, the the security researcher showed that. They could get unauthenticated access to the Jenkins server. Mm-hmm. From there, they could look at build workspaces within Jenkins, and those uh, had access to source code. And that source code uh, contained, can you guess? Had secrets, it, for sure. It had our coded secrets. That's not good. And that's bad. Definitely not a good thing to keep hard coded secrets. Yeah. Ideally, you know, you should avoid it as much as you can. You should be making sure that your code generates secrets on the fly. Uh, and doesn't contain uh, secrets, or at least not long-term ones, and at least not high-privileged ones. So what else did they do? What else did they find? So once they get access to the dashboard, mm-hmm. uh, they sort of, sort of look around, 
and they found a few things that were really interesting. Uh, one was they found FTP credentials, you know, credentials for FTP servers. And uh, one of the servers had uh, a bunch of what's known as ACARS messages, which is short for Aircraft Communication Addressing and Reporting System, which is a, a very uh, boring way of saying like messages transmitted between airplanes in the ground. Um, mm -hmm. And the second thing they found, which is a bit more troubling, was API credentials for Prometheus API endpoint, which basically let the security researcher, in theory, I'm not saying they did this, um, uh, modify uh, flight information. That'd be really mean. Yeah. To that, that's like the worst thing that can happen. You're like at the airport, and security researchers like can't solve flight today. Yeah, no, nope, not today. And the third thing, which was the, the, the most horrible one, uh, was that they also exposed uh, keys to AWS uh, to their AWS uh, cloud environment, uh, specifically for S3. Packed your keys, everybody. Yeah. Uh, S3 buckets and DynamoDB tables. Uh, and these had flight plans and maintenance data for the planes and crew member. And I also really like when, you know, it's COVID, my planes are clean. What do you mean? Well, well maintenance didn't, yeah. I think it's like maintenance and it's like fixing. Oh, yeah. I also like when the plane works. The plane, yeah. you know, flies properly. The plane could be dirty. Isn't yeah. It is a crap. <laughs> All important. Yes. Commute air is a warning. Clean and, and, and well-maintained. Fine. Yes, but they lack cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, so besides all that data, they also found, like I mentioned, the TSA no fly list. This was a nice guy who found this information. Yeah. What did he do? What did he do with all that? It could have been a her. I don't know. Sorry. I shouldn't have assumed. What did they do with this information? So um, uh, they made it available to journalists to sort of, you know, show that this is a big deal, which is it, which it is. Uh, they also made it available to a company, to a uh, they also made it available to a website called DDoS Secrets, which is sort of like WikiLeaks. Like you can send them stuff that you found that might be confidential information or stuff that you want to make sure that other people know about. Um, but uh, unfortunately, this leaked somehow uh, and it made its way to breach forums, which is a place where people, um, you know, publish stuff that they found online for everybody to see. Spread like wildfire. And it spread like wildfire. And now it's available for everyone. So anyone can download this list, but unfortunately. Got it. Um, so this is a cautionary tale. How do you prevent this from happening in your own organization? So Jenkins is something that a lot of people use and a lot of companies use. Um, there are two good ways to go about this. One is you can use a configuration scanner, uh, you know, which scans your servers that are hosting Jenkins servers to make sure that they're properly configured uh, by checking the configuration files, making sure that all the right flags are, are, are turned on or turned off. Go do that if you're listening. Immediately. Um, and the other thing you can do is, which, which is what's similar to this uh, security researcher did, is use a network scanner, which is sort of like trying to uh, discover just Jenkins dashboards out there that might be publicly exposed within your IP range. Go do that too. Yeah, which is actually might be even easier for a lot of companies if they don't have a configuration scanner. Yeah. Amazing. Let's assume that everyone was listening to every single thing we said, but it, really quickly, can you recap our solution? Or a fascination, why not? Um, can you really quickly recap in 30 seconds? Go. So here's the stuff that we spoke about. We spoke about RC vulnerabilities and CWP and so on manage engine, uh, which you should definitely patch, patch, patch if they're exposed online. Don't patch once, don't patch twice, patch, patch, patch. Patch once. I need to patch more than once. Okay. <laughs> um, we also spoke about a few uh, really important incidents that happened. Uh, one was Circle CI got breached and customer secrets were stolen. The second was the go-to got breach and customer usernames and passwords were stolen. And the third is that Commute Air got security researched rather than breached. Um, and for crying out cloud, the TSA no flat who you got with. <laughs> um, thank you. Up to the pun. It was a good pun. Thank you for listening to Crying Out Cloud. And thank you for joining us today. That was fun. Talk to you guys next month. See you later. Bye.